so the word the word chaos seems a bit harsh. Uh, if you tell people that we use chaos as a uh, development process, uh, you might flinch and think, "Are you are you mad? Uh, how can it be a sustainable way of developing?" Uh, and, and is it really chaos? Uh, but to prove that it, it is chaos, I have uh, brought a picture of our developers uh, here. So you can, you can see that it, uh, it is truly a chaotic environment to work in. I recognize a few faces from here as well. <coughs> All right, uh, I'll start with a... Uh, a short story about uh, my earlier uh, career and uh, a few different ways of uh, developing software uh, and uh, well, how, how I uh, thought about Agile before coming to, uh, to Televox. Uh, I first worked at this, uh, this company, uh, a product company, developing a, a CMS, a content management system for uh, web applications. Uh, and the whole process was uh, extremely waterfall-based. Uh, um, the, uh, the manager uh, talked to the customers uh, and uh, identified their needs, came to me and gave me the second-hand information, which I transformed into a requirement specification, uh, a long list of uh, the application shall have a top menu, and the top menu shall have menu items, and the menu items <laughs> shall consist of a, an image and a title. Uh, so just this horrific list of uh, requirements. Uh, totally useless, didn't uh, produce any value at all for the customers, uh, but was extremely handy uh, after uh, the uh, the document had been signed by the customer because then we could just say ah you if you want this feature it's not in the uh, the document so you have to pay extra excellent and the manager really liked that to uh, to pay extra or to um, make the customers pay more uh, so having this kind of document was extremely difficult to to get an overview of the whole system you never knew exactly uh, what the the whole project would end up like. You only knew the, the specific details. Uh, and it all came to a, a horrific turn uh, one day when the, the manager started developing a prototype for a new product and making me write the, the specifications to match his prototype. So he did all the development uh, and then I had to basically document what he had done, but as a requirement specification so we later could sell it to, uh, to customers. Uh, horrific uh, place, <laughs> horrific thing to do as a developer. I produce no value, just a, a bunch of documentation. So I left the company. Uh, so this is a, a scrum, a scrummage in, in rugby. Uh, and I will try to talk about how I uh, try to experience scrum at this, uh, this next company. Once again, once again, I was doing web development, uh, and we were kind of stuck in this uh, circle of uh, uh, putting out fires, uh, fixing bugs, uh, and uh, always reacting, never acting or developing new new value for the customer. So we thought that uh, okay, if we just we sit down, we uh, we apply Scrum to this process, uh, we might be able to save our souls and. Uh, produce some value for the customer. Uh, and uh, everyone was on board. Uh, the developers were happy. Uh, our managers seemed okay with it. And the customer had heard uh, great things about Scrum. Uh, it was a uh, buzzword uh, of the time, so everyone uh, wanted to join in. Uh, so we set it up. We identified some key stories and some key uh, issues we had to uh, or fires we had to put out before we could start working. And uh, we put together a backlog, we prioritized the, uh, the items and uh, started working. Everyone was uh, happy. Uh, but suddenly it felt like we were sabotaged from within because our uh, earlier project manager, uh, now the Scrum Master, uh, kind of uh, fell back into uh, old, old habits and started uh, 
uh, managing uh, too much of the process. Uh, all the, the estimates were altered to better suit the customers' uh, um, customers' expect expectations. Uh, and when we tried to uh, track how much time we had uh, spent on each issue, uh, we couldn't uh, report more time than what was uh, previously estimated, so we couldn't over-budget the, um, the project. Uh, also, new, new stories were added, and uh, new stories and tasks were added during the sprints, uh, so we all end up with this uh, uh, horrific process again of uh, basically just putting out fires all day long. Uh, the customer was uh, discouraged and uh, never wanted to try Scrum again because they had now lived through Scrum uh, as they believed. And uh, well, it seemed like we would just start uh, or, or keep putting out fires forever. So I left that company as well. <coughs> and I, I heard about Televox from a friend. Um, and I was um, very excited to uh, to join them. Uh, I thought that uh, I had heard heard during my interviews that they were doing uh, doing agile, and agile in my my mind was uh, Scrum at the time. Uh, so I thought, oh, finally, someone doing Scrum the the right way. Uh, I've had so so much so many uh, horrific experiences in the past. So finally, I will be saved by the process. Excellent. Uh, so I was, I was very eager when I joined, and I was handed my first uh, mission uh, orally. Uh, just uh, create this uh, oversight of the uh, bonus payments to our retailers, our wholesales, and our internal sellers. Okay, uh, but where? What, what should it uh, work like? What what are the bonuses, uh, or anything like that? Well, no, just sit down, figure it out. Go ask the right people. Uh, okay, so I started working. Uh, sat down at my computer, uh, looked around, and saw that there there is no scrum board here, uh, and there didn't seem to be any uh, software uh, allowing a scrum board. No, no uh, issue tracking system or uh, things like that. So, so I, uh, I kept uh, wondering, well, where is this process? I, I thought we were doing Agile. I thought we were going to do Scrum. Uh, but no one was doing stand-ups, no, no daily meetings, no, uh, no one had uh, a bunch of post-its uh, lying around or moving them uh, on, on the table anywhere. Uh, there was no time tracking. I couldn't find out wh where, where should I report how much time I've spent on this issue. Uh, or, or more importantly, how how will I track my own time so that I can get paid in the uh, in the end of the month, which was quite important to me at the time, or now as well, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, so in my mind, it was total chaos. I, I had got, I hadn't uh, I, I didn't see the process anywhere, so I didn't understand what how how am I supposed to work. Um, so time went on, and I uh, started figuring out uh, what kind of expectations were uh, were placed upon me as a developer. Uh, still confused about the process, I didn't really know how we were supposed to to work. Uh, it still felt quite chaotic to me. Uh, there was a, a total lack of, of structure. Just sit down uh, or walk around, uh, talk to people, and figure out what's the best way uh, to implement a feature or a, a task. Uh, and it wasn't until I went to a talk on uh, called Implementing Programmer Anarchy by Fred George, uh, when I started placing bits of the, uh, uh, the puzzles in my head, and I, I, I kind of found a... Um, a, uh, a structure to the chaos. Uh, for in, in program anarchy, uh, it's all about the developer. You remove everything else and have only developers uh, responsible for the whole chain of, of software development, from everything to identifying the needs uh, and the requirements, to implementing it, to uh, placing it in production, and following, up, following it up 
later on. And you do this by just entrusting them uh, and placing all the responsibility on them. Uh, and, and they will automatically manage themselves and uh, <coughs> figure out what to do. Which seemed um, a lot like uh, what we were doing. Uh, and it, uh, by removing all the constraints from the developers, uh, that uh, external managers or uh, uh, a bunch of requirements would do, you allow, allow the developers to act freely and, and make educated decisions. They, they often know best uh, anyway uh, on, on which uh, implementation to choose from a, um, a bunch of possibilities. Uh, I remember Fred George talked about a, uh, a case where they rewrote an entire system uh, or, or a microsystem they had in, in Ruby just to try out Ruby. Uh, and it worked much better than the, the old system and the throughput uh, increased and uh, everything was uh, awesome. Uh, and then the developers sat down and they rewrote the entire system again in Clojure, just because they wanted to try Clojure. Uh, and they did that and it was even better and then they rewrote it once more in Clojure because they had learned a lot of, of uh, stuff on how to use Clojure. Uh, and this, this third rewriting of the, the system was finally placed in production and worked tons tons better than the, the original. Uh, they could scale down on the number of servers, they could uh, increase the traffic to the system, and uh, everything went freaking awesome. And that would never have been, uh, been possible if uh, they had a, a manager uh, peeking over their shoulder all the time, uh, trying to uh, manage their uh, how much time you spend on each issue and uh, oh, you should just leave this, it's good enough, move along and, and uh, uh, go do something else. Uh, but instead, by removing all the roles, you allow the, the developers to analyze and implement and roll out everything uh, by themselves. So, so in program anarchy, you have to remove the managers, uh, the testers, uh, the ex external uh, quality assurance department, and uh, all, all business analysts. Uh, and I, I mostly bring up business analysts uh, to uh, show you this picture from uh, Office Space. I've never seen a business analyst uh, f for real it's who just does business analyst. Uh, but this guy, if, if you haven't seen Office Space, you should go do it immediately. It's an awesome movie. Uh, but this this guy uh, basically just uh, brings the he takes the specifications from the customers and and gives them to the to the developers uh, because he has people skills and th this guy would have no place in our organization uh, because most of our developers hopefully have people skills and can't talk to the customers anyway. I think most developers can nowadays. So what is this uh, this chaos uh, that we have? Well, I I felt inspired after hearing about this uh, the anarchy, uh, and I started putting pieces together, and I figured out that the what I had thought was laziness from the <laughs> management at Telebox, uh, or the unwillingness to to implement a a structure or a a process, was actually quite hard work to not having to uh, to do that, not placing a strict, rigid structure upon the development department. And the development department at Telebox is, is not just uh, passive developers. They're quite active in uh, finding new ways uh, to, uh, to solve problems, finding new products, uh, and developing the entire business. So it's, it's a product and a development apartment. Uh, So at Telebox, we have no managers, uh, no uh, product managers, no controllers, no analysts uh, whatsoever. Uh, instead, we, we need every, every developer to manage at least themselves, and in some cases, a few others, when uh, training new guys and, uh, uh, or when uh, doing uh, bigger missions, perhaps. Uh, or in a way you could say that we have only managers since all the developers need to manage themselves. It depends on, where you, on what way you look at it. We have no testers or no external uh, quality assurance 
department. Uh, instead, we place all, all of the responsibility on the developer to, uh, to really look at their, their problem and try to, uh, to identify where do I need to test this? Do I need to write unit tests to figure out the basic functionality of my code? Or do I need an, an integration test to see how this works in the, uh, the real production environment? And, and once the tests are written and, and run, you also have to, to follow up when, when the code has been placed in production uh, and, and continuously uh, check that it, it works and that it works according to the, the user's needs in the end. We do uh, no requirements, basically. All our... Uh, uh, whenever a, a developer get a, gets a, a task or a story or a mission or whatever you call it, they uh, they are quite quite broad in the uh, definition. They're always in the uh, the sense of uh, make this a bit better or uh, create something that solves this problem or this thing doesn't work exactly as I want it to. It should do something better. Uh, so it's, it's very broad and very difficult uh, to to develop something without first going and, and talking to everyone, all the users, on how uh, how do you want this to to actually work? What's the what's the real problem behind this, and what are the actual needs uh, that made you write this uh, this task? So so uh, of course there are hidden requirements because there there always needs to be uh, the, the end goal is something at least uh, so it's just they are uh, never written down uh, you have to find them on yourself or by yourself and since we have no requirements we can't have any uh, estimates basically uh, it wouldn't be worth anything to to estimate how how long will it take to make this new product thing uh, so uh, so, so no estimates. Uh, I don't think you've ever had them at Telebox. And also, there is uh, basically no budget, uh, which is kind of nice as a developer. Uh, but again, since we have no estimates, we have no budget to uh, to take time from. Uh, and in instead of focusing on the budget or how long things will take. We will focus on the, uh, the vision of the, uh, the product. Wh where are we going? Uh, what needs to be done to get there? So, so if we have a feature that is needed to be done to, to fulfill the vision, we just have to develop it, no matter the cost in time or, or money. Uh, and at the same time, we, we're not afraid to, to cancel an ongoing uh, development, uh, to just throw it all away if we have identified that we want to go uh, in a, another direction. So, uh, s but perhaps it still uh, sounds a bit chaotic. Uh, it still sounds so to me. Uh, and uh, you probably ask yourself, is, uh, is this really possible to have a, a development department uh, just uh, roaming free, doing whatever they feel like all the time. Uh, it sounds a bit extreme to me and uh, perhaps to you. Uh, and hopefully uh, Henrik will bring some clarity to how this actually works and uh, <coughs> why it uh, has succeeded so far. Um, all right, thank you, Jonas, so much. Um, I will be top, I've been around for a couple more extra years than Jonas when we were just um, two, three developers doing this. And of course, if you're just one guy, this is fairly easy to, to have anarchy in your own head. Uh, I gotta click it, right? Yeah. Um, so I'll be talking about how. Um, how is this possible? What, what are the situations that made us end up here? And is it really working? Um, I think first of all, to be able to do this, you gotta have a, a mandate. You gotta, people need to trust you to be able to do it. And the first thing you need to do, and the most important thing, is you gotta have a vision. You gotta have an, your own North Star. Where are you heading? What are we doing? What do you wanna do? You can't just, because there won't be any requirements thrown at you. 
Uh, you got to have a vision, a North Star, head that way. Uh, so you always need to discuss with your peers and, and your fellow colleagues, what's the end goal? What's, how do we get to world domination? Which is where we're heading, by the way. Um, what's our 5.0 version, even though we're just starting this? Uh, what's our 5.0? What's our, if we had all the resources in the world, where would we end up? That's our vision. Uh, that could change slightly, but we got to have that, 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 uh, that star in the horizon. So we know when, when we're about doing our things, we're all heading the same direction anyway. Um, so that's really important to talk about that and, and to have that. And that's why we call the product and development department. We're not just developing things for other stakeholders that comes knocking on our doors. We have our own agenda and our own, and our own direction. So having said that, once that visionary meeting is over, it's about shipping products all the time. It's about releasing, deploying, and getting it out there. So as soon as we figure out the 5.0 version, we start by the 0.1 version. The smallest, the minimal viable product. The absolutely smallest thing that makes sense that we can ship and deliver and actually get out in production. Um, so we deploy stuff every day. I think we do 10 upgrades a day or something like that. Uh, with new, sh new small incremental features or bug fixes. So always ship. And we have a, we have a deployment department, so to speak, but uh, people that are working on deployment, but they're not actually deploying things. They're just making sure everybody else can deploy them. So they're just helping. You don't hand their, them their, your code. You just let them um, make sure it's easy for everybody to, to upgrade and, and release code. So this cycle gets really fast. So decide on, on, on the major version, major... Um, vision you want to have, and then do it in small, small, minimal chunks. The next thing you want to do is to have, to have a team um, and culture. Um, and I think that should be based on, on trust. Trust is probably the most important word. Uh, you got to trust each other, both directions. Uh, senior developers need to trust junior ones, and junior ones need to trust the develop the senior one, you got to trust the CEO that he, he and or she wants to do the things that is best for the company. Um, and, 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 um, and I think the best way to define a culture or a vision is to talk about things we don't do. This is not a Televox way of doing things. This is not what we would do. Uh, that can sometimes define a, a vision better than actually what we're doing. Um, so set a culture, make sure you always talk about these things. How will we solve that if we do, do it? Um, and, and make a tight team that, that can take those micro decisions themselves without having to ask around. Uh, and it helps if people stay in the company. It helps if you build teams that, that work for longer times together and start to get to learn each other. Um, hit it. Um, to be able to, to maneuver in these waters that are slightly blurry, uh, you got to have fast, fast feedback. Um, and by deploying real fast, you'll get the answers the next day. Did it work? Are, are, there, are we getting a lot of customer support on this feature? Are we, are we liking it ourselves? Uh, and that feedback should always come back to you as a developer. So you have to, what's called dog feeding. It's about eating your own dog food. It's about um, understanding that if I do something with less quality than it's supposed to have, It'll just go back to me, and I'll have to figure it, fix, fix it tomorrow instead. So that way, you can always know, let the, the let the developer decide on quality versus quantity in every decision by having that feedback loop be fast and get back to the exact same place where it was where it originated. Finally, to get that mandate and to get that the whole organization around you as a development department to trust you, you got to still be able to execute and deliver. Uh, at the end of the day, you get judged by what you have presented. But I think that usually works out fine. As long as you do these things, you usually will be shipping stuff every day. And if you miss something, it's not the end of the world because you can just fix them the next day. If you spend a lot of time on requirements and all those things and it happens to be wrong and you spend six months on doing something that nobody wants, then you're in trouble. This way, by using this methodology, you won't miss the target. It's a, it's a, a home-seeking a missile, basically. Um, so, but in the end, you got to deliver to be able to get this mandate from around you. Um, there are some downsides, obviously. I'm not going to lie. That is annoying. 
She's coming here. Um, there are some downsides that you have to accept. I don't think you can fix them. Uh, you just got to have to accept them in a sense. Um, well, first of all, the biggest one, I think, just hit that door, uh, then key button, no? Well, I get, get some video. Um, the first thing and the biggest problem, I think, is you, you can't promise anything. Or you can promise some things. You can't promise this will be done in the fall. You'll have this button in next year. You'll have this button next week. The only thing you can promise is the product's going to get better. I'm going to deliver good. Uh, and that, uh, that is a tough one. Uh, but I think by having culture and, and learning, teaching your customers and your, your fellow people around you that, that you keep delivering good stuff, it will work out and people will accept it. Uh, so the way we sell to our customers, we usually tell them, this is a cloud-based service. This is as is today. This is what you're going to get. And they go like, can we get this thing next year? Can we get this when it's this coming? So we can't tell you when it's coming. We just know one year ago, this product was, we didn't have this feature, this feature, this feature. And we're investing more now. We have more guys working on it. And, um, and we're delivering more code every day than ever. So it's going to be better. I can't tell you exactly what it is, but you just have to trust us on that. Um, how's that working out? <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> oh, well. Um, so that's a big one, obviously. Are we late? Are we? How is, it, how is this working? Are we, are, we, uh, are we delivering? When was this supposed to be done? Are people performing? It's hard to, hard to answer when you don't have estimates. Are we late? Um, is this taking longer than it should? It's, it's hard. It's hard. Hard to know. But you get just have to trust it. Uh, you have to evaluate constantly. And, and by having these micro loops all the time, I think most of the times you hit the right target and you do it as efficiently as you can. Accountability. I hesitated to have that up here. Um, who to blame when something's not working out? Um, when you have a chain of commands and requirements and, and, and people to blame who can blame their boss and the, their boss will blame the ones underneath them and so on, it's very easy uh, to point fingers. It's, hard, it's still, still easy to do it here, I think. You just have to do it differently. Uh, you have to, usually the problem is small because we fix it the next day. And that way the, the dog feeding process works well and you know who did the wrong and they fix it. Um, and if there are bigger problems, you usually figure it out yourself. It just, it's less finger pointing and more quality an analysis of, of who's, who's, who, mis who mis misstepped. Uh, but once again, we don't have those major ones because we're so iterative and we keep changing things. That way we avoid most of the, uh, the big, big ones where uh, everybody's shouting in the office. And as personally, and for some developers, it can be traumatic not to know what to do next week or what to do this fall or where are we heading and what I'm, I'm uh, me myself I'm in charge of the product and where we're heading uh, and I don't know really know what we will do this fall I have a list of ten things I want to do probably won't be a time to do three of them or four of them major ones but I just don't know and that can be frustrating um, personally I think um. Um, I think the uh, upsides do uh, over outweigh the outnumber the, the downsides, though, obviously, since we're doing this. Now, this is all fine and dandy as well. Um, we are sort of, like Jonas said, we, we ended up here with a small company growing, and it's easy when you're three, two, three guys doing it, it's fairly easy to have this process. But, uh, like Jonas said, we actually work hard at not removing the chaos. I don't know how many meetings I've been to where we, should, where we say we should hire a product manager or a coordinator, somebody who just takes care of meetings and makes sure everybody's doing it. We always end up like, we should do it. And then we always say like, no, we, want that. we don't want that overhead. Uh, so we always refrain from doing that. But it's a temptation for everybody just to hire somebody to coordinate. Um, so stay away from that, I think. Uh, there are some other things you have to... Um, to think about, and some things that are, we are fortunate to have around us to help uh, help this process, the soil that we work in. 
Well, first of all, we're a tech and product driven company. We're not sales driven in that sense. Uh, and w the owners and the founders are like that, automation, technology, and, and believe in the product and development should, should take the lead. That helps a lot. Um, and I think the rest of the company, sales department and uh, operational parts and, and other stakeholders have come to learn that and the culture. So they accept it and they realize they won't get a deadline, deadline from us. Uh, how much they yell. Um, so that, that is something you need and that, that, that's what we got and that um, helps out. Customers can be uh, demanding. Uh, we are fortunate enough to have a cloud-based service for, like I said, uh, uh, telephony systems. Our largest customers have thousands of users and we send a big invoice to them. But there's still just a fraction of our, um, of our uh, total revenue. So we have the luxury of not having to listen to our customers. Uh, we listen to them. We listen to their needs, but we don't have to listen to their uh, solutions or their suggested solutions, which is a big difference, I think. And since we use our own products, we're 130 of us, we're actually the best customer to listen to. Every developer is using the product and can listen to themselves and their needs and figure it out that way. But by not having to listen to exactly what your customers say and by the process of selling the product, like I talked about earlier, really helps us to be focused on our own vision and not have to listen to anybody else. Um, that's not the case for everybody though, obviously, in other fields. We have a business model, it's cloud-based service, monthly costs, uh, that helps a lot. If you sell big infrastructure or if you sell large products in chunks, um, it's a different matter. If you ship an, an, an OS every uh, two years, it's quite different than if you can do this monthly. If you like it, stay on it. If you don't like it, just cancel your subscription. That, that really helps this process out um, and keeps us uh, working the way we are. I'm gonna run over this a bit in the same way and um, try to answer if this, if this is for everybody. Uh, it's probably not, but what can you do to get there? Uh, what do you need to change um, from that perspective instead? Well, first of all, you got to get the customers to trust you. And if you're a, the, 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 probably the hardest example, if you're a consultant and you sell large projects, they want to know what they're paying for. If they want to pay you millions of kroners, they, they probably want to know what they're going to get. So I know it's a tough one. Uh, I'm not going to lie. There, there will be requirements. But I think you can build up trust by constantly delivering good stuff. You can as a consultant, even as a consultant. Uh, be able to say, let's cut back on the estimates and requirements and just give us a direction and talk about our direction and we'll spend a few months on it and I think you guys will be happy and we'll produce more for you. Um, so I think even, even in that extreme sense, you can push it in that direction, in software development anyway, by constantly releasing and then tweaking the, uh, the requirements. Owners and CEOs and, and boards and those things, they need to trust. Um, I, I'm not saying they should get let go of control as in not care. I think caring is even more important in these kind of things. You have to have attention to details. We got a CEO who's down pointing at pixels every once in a while and wondering what version of Debian servers are we running and all those things. And he really cares. And I care when I'm in meetings. I care about should there be a dot there or whatever. Um, so it's not about saying, okay, you guys figure it out. I'm just going to be over here managing and make sure you have the resources. Um, you have to care, but then you have to, you have to ask hard questions as a developer to developer, ask questions team to team. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And then back out. So decision making should be done where people actually are doing the work. They should take the decisions. You should just challenge them, get into the details, talk about it, care, and know what they're doing, but then back out and, and uh, let, let the developers do and figure out what to do, uh, where they're heading. That is a tricky one. Uh, it's tempting to go down there and, and micromanage. Um, and reiterate, um, you gotta have the mandate. You gotta have a vision. Uh, you have to have, okay, let, let us design some for you. Uh, the extreme case again, as a consultant, just don't listen. Try to take in charge of what, where the product heading, can we do this, can we add this? And really be stubborn there and try, try to get your vision across because 
that is the first thing you do. Otherwise, you just be asking for requirements and you have dependencies on, on uh, where you're heading. Um, so that is one thing to do as well. There is one more. The business model, once again, hard to change. I think most of the, a lot of companies are changing. Uh, and, and it might be actually because of this process as well, why Microsoft is, is releasing their last OS this summer and turning everything to subscription-based. Uh, it's not the, the whole story, but it's part of the story. Why, why um, iPhone is releasing major features multiple times every year, not just every summer. They want to be faster, they want to be more iterative uh, in every step. So having a business model that support this is really important. All right. There are a few areas we don't know anything about. Uh, I'm going to just throw them out there. Uh, first of all, like I said, when we were eight of us, I, when we were three of us, we thought eight's not going to work. When we were eight, we thought 15. That's ridiculous. Then we need managers, a lot of them. Um, now we're 25, we're, turning, we're getting into 30 now soon. And we're scared a bit. There's no book telling us how 50 developers would, would handle this. Uh, the only thing we know is we trust the process and, and the organizational uh, development process is pretty much the same as the code development process. We iterate. We ask ourselves, where, the, where are the bottlenecks? What is in your way right now? What should be changed? And we change it that day. We don't wait six months to have a reorganization. We change it the very day we figure out we have a bottleneck by slowly, slowly tweaking it. And, and that's the only thing we can trust, that this, this, this model, this anarchy works uh, for the organizational development as well. So hopefully I can have a, a speech room, there's two of, 200 of us, and it'll still be the same, uh, same slides. Uh, we'll wait and see. I, we had this culture, and it's just pretty much the same platform, the same people, the same culture, and that helps a tremendous amount. You c culture is the hardest thing to change, and how do you affect that? How do you, when people leave, uh, how do you, with, with values and so on, how do you keep it, and how do you change it fast? Because you can't change that in months. You gotta, that's years, and, and constantly uh, compromising of features you want to do by t to just keep the, um, the culture in place. So it could get stormy if, you're, if, you're not, um, if, you, if the culture is not there. Deadlines. Even though we say we don't have any, even though uh, we don't want to have them, external ones anyway, they're still there. We have press releases and, and events and, and launches and marketing reasons to have launches. Uh, so we have to cope with them. They always hit us from a side a bit and everybody gets awkward. Where there's a deadline there? Are we late? Are we? What happened? Uh, so we have to learn to cope with those as well uh, forever. And I think we're handling it all right, but we can get better, definitely. I think this is the toughest one for me anyway. Is this the best way? Is this, are we, there are no estimates, there, are we, are, is this the best way, is, are we good? Are we doing well? I just wish we could start another team doing another model next to us and just doing the same, same product but in a different way and really benchmark it. Um, you just have to trust it, the model, and think you're doing the best thing and ask around, could this have been better? What have we done? So, um, I believe it is, but that's, I think I have to be a believer, not a knower for uh, many years more. All right, sum it up, one word, trust. Trust the system, trust your colleagues, both directions, not just trusting people underneath you, trust people beside you, other departments, trust the CEO that he wants to do or she wants to do the best thing out there. Um, Customers need to trust you and the other way around. If not, you become a sad puppy, right, Jonas? <laughs>